Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is Unit 5, um, October 2022 of the Pearson at Excel International AL uh, paper. Let's take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. So, the first question here says, when copper is added to concentrated nitric acid, a brown gas is given off and the final solution is blue in terms of oxidation number and electron transfer. How does the nitrogen change in this reaction? So, which reaction is he talking about? Copper plus nitric acid to give copper nitrate plus, of course, the, nitro the brown gas is nitrogen dioxide. Uh, the blue solution is the copper nitrate. And he's saying what is happening to the oxidation number and the electron transfer. So let's calculate the oxidation number of nitrogen in each of its compounds. So let's say in nitric acid, what is the oxidation number of nitrogen? Well, let's see. The hydrogen is plus one. Each oxygen is minus two. So the three oxygens are minus six. And that means the nitrogen in nitric acid is plus 5. What about copper nitrate? Well, copper is plus 2. Each oxygen is minus 2, so I have a total of minus 12. So overall, the nitrogen is plus 5. What about in NO2? Remember, the balancing has nothing to do with our oxidation number. NO2. Each oxygen is minus 2, so the two of them are minus 4, and that means the N is plus 4. So what is happening to the oxidation number? It's going from plus 5 to plus 4, so it is decreasing. Now, you should realize that decrease in oxidation number is reduction, and that means gain of electrons. What is the pressure of hydrogen gas used in the standard hydrogen electrode? What is the standard hydrogen electrode? Remember, this is the reference that we use in electrochemical cells. And the standard hydrogen electrode has hydrogen gas going in at a pressure of one atmosphere. But what are my choices? I don't have one atmosphere. But I should know that one atmosphere is 100 kilopascal or 100,000 pascal. So remember that in the standard hydrogen electrode, the hydrogen is at a pressure of one atmosphere or 100,000 pascal. An electrochemical cell is set up using the electrode systems show. What materials will be used for the electrodes? Well, let's see. What are the reactions? The reactions are uh, potassium dichromate, and I have titanium 3 plus going to titanium uh, O2 plus. What are the materials for the electrodes? Well, our choices are chromium, titanium, and so on. Remember that the cell does not involve titanium metal or chromium metal. So the electrodes will not be any of these metals. It will actually be just the uh, inert platinum electrode. The reaction between dichromate ions and titanium 3 plus ions has an E cell of plus 1.14 volt. The standard electrode potential for the dichromate uh, CR3 plus electrode system is plus 1.33. What is the standard electrode potential for the titanium O2 plus, titanium 3 plus system? Okay, let's take a look at this. What is the cell? Remember that E cell is equal to E oxidation plus E reduction. Now. If our total E cell is 1.14 and he's telling me the chromate to chromium 3 plus, of course, chromate to chromium 3 plus, that is my E reduction. So from that, my E oxidation is actually minus 
4.19 but that is for what for oxidation and he wants the e for this reaction the titanium o2 plus to titanium 3 plus so this is actually he's asking for the e of the reduction of that cell remember that if we say that the e oxidation is minus 0.19 then the E for that reaction from titanium O2 plus to titanium 3 plus is actually a plus 0.19. Do we understand this? Of course, we get these numbers also from the data booklet. There is a table for, you probably know, there is a table in the data booklet from where you can get the uh, electrode potentials. And all the electrode potentials are listed in reduction. So if you're looking for the opposite, it is the opposite sign for the E of that equation. Okay, the next question says the possibility of a reaction between potassium dichromate and hydrochloric acid may be assessed using standard electrode potentials but also depends on activation energy so for example he gives me this cell and he says the e cell is minus remember that if an e cell is a negative number then this uh, reaction is probably not very feasible or it, it cannot actually work when potassium dichromate and hydrochloric acid are mixed very little Chlorine is formed under standard conditions. That is because, of course, the E cell is negative. It's negative 0, 0.0 something. So this is very close to zero. So some of it will react. But a significant amount of chlorine is produced when concentrated hydrochloric acid is used. So what do you think is the effect on the E cell and on the energy of activation of using concentrated hydrochloric acid why is it that when we use concentrated hydrochloric acid then the reaction uh, is faster or we get more chlorine that tells me that when we use concentrated hydrochloric acid the e cell becomes more positive however remember that concentration of the uh, reactants does not have any effect on activation energy so our activation energy would be unchanged the element zinc is not classified as a transition metal why is that remember what is definition of transition metal the definition for transition metal as we know it in the syllabus is defined as a D block element. So it's something in the D block and zinc is in the D block, that's fine. But I want it to form one or more stable ions with an incomplete D sublevel. So the stable ions of the element should have incomplete D sublevel. So when you look at zinc, zinc has electronic structure 3D10, for S2, and the only stable uh, ion that it, fo it forms is zinc 2 plus. Now, remember that when they form ions, the electrons are first lost from the 4S. When the metal loses an electron, the electrons are lost from the 4S, and then we lose from the 3D. So if we have zinc 2 plus, that means we have just lost the two electrons in the 4S, but our 3D is still full. So we don't regard zinc as a transition metal because the only stable zinc ion has the electronic configuration 3D10, so it has a full D sub level that is not a transition metal. What is the electronic configuration of Fe2 plus? Again, we need to write the electron configuration of Fe. Well, Fe is 26 electrons, so this is the full electron configuration. Now, when it forms 2 plus, again, we lose which electron? We lose the two electrons in the 4s. So I am left with 3D6. Remember, when we're filling the 3Ds, we put one into each of the orbitals, and then we start to pair them. 
So if we have six, we put one, one, one into each of the D and then we pair the one of the Ds. So that is how we write the electron configuration of Fe2+. Platinum forms a complex with this formula, which is used in cancer treatment. Three possible structures of this complex are shown. The complex used in cancer treatment is which of these? You should remember that the um, complex of platinum that is used in cancer treatment is the cis platine. Can you see platine with two chlorines and two ammonias in cis? So that is the one that is used for cancer treatment. And this has a square planar structure. So X would be the one that we use for cancer treatment. What about Y? Y is a trans. We don't use the trans, we use the cis. And Z is a cis, but it is tetrahedral? No, it's not tetrahedral, it's square, square planar. So only X is used in cancer treatment. When oxygen binds to the heme group in hemoglobin, each oxygen molecule does what? Do you remember hemoglobin? This is the heme group in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is this kind of structure with Fe2 plus in the middle. Now, this is a structure that tends to bind with oxygen. Now, does it bind reversibly or irreversibly? Well, you should realize that it binds reversibly because when there is lots of oxygen, the oxygen binds to the hemoglobin. When there is less oxygen in the surrounding cells, then the oxygen is given to the cells. So this is a reversible uh, reaction. So remember that oxygen binds to the heme group in hemoglobin reversibly. And it binds to the Fe2 plus in the middle of the uh, heme group or the hemoglobin. The sequence shown is the mechanism for a reaction in aqueous solution. And he's saying, in the overall reaction, what is happening? Well, let us try and write the overall reaction for these three steps. Remember, when you're writing an overall reaction, you cross whatever is the same on the left and on the right on different steps. So, for example, I have Ag plus used up in step one, formed in step two, that cancels. The Ag2 plus is formed in step one, used up in step two, that cancels. The titanium 2 plus formed in step two, and then used up in step three, that cancels. So, my overall reaction is what is left. So which of these applies? He's saying oxidation of Ag plus is catalyzed by cerium. You should remember that if something is used in step one and then um, regenerated in step two, that is the catalyst. So the Ag plus actually is the catalyst, not the Ce4 plus. So the oxidation actually of titanium is catalyzed by the silver ions because it is used up in step one. So I added it in step one and it was used up, but then it was regenerated in step two. So overall, uh, nothing happens to it. It remains unchanged. How many sigma bonds and pi bonds are there in a molecule of benzene? Okay. Remember that benzene is this kind of structure. This is what we call the Kekulé structure, the one with alternating double bonds. You should remember which ones have sigma and which ones have pi. The single bonds all have sigma. And the double bonds also have one sigma. So where is the sigma? All these blue bonds are sigma. Now, the double bond has one sigma and one pi. So if I have three double bonds around the benzene, then I have three pi bonds and a total of 12 sigma bonds. All of these single bonds are sigma. So this is a total of 12 sigma bonds. Okay. Benzene reacts with fuming sulfuric acid to form benzene sulfonic acid. 
fuming sulfuric acid is what? When he says fuming sulfuric acid, you remember where we used that? We used that when we were trying to add a sulfo uh, sulfonic acid group on the benzene. And we said, in order to add an SO3H on the benzene, I have to react it with fuming sulfuric acid. And you should realize that fuming sulfuric acid is concentrated sulfuric acid that contains dissolved sulfur trioxide. The structure of the amino acid isoleucine is shown. What is the systema systematic name of isoleucine? Okay. In order to... Uh, determining the systematic name, we first look at the longest chain. And remember that you start counting from the acid group. So this is our chain. So this is actually something made up of five carbons. So we're looking at pentanoic acid, not butanoic. Then where are the substituents? We have an amine group on carbon number two and a methyl group on carbon number three. So our name is two amino three methyl and remember that the um substituents are arranged alphabetically so that is why the amino comes before the methyl so that is the name of that compound then he's saying what is the structure of isoleucine in a solution of ph2 remember that isoleucine is an amino acid when you put it in acidic ph what is the structure of amino acid in acidic pH? Remember, the acid is a full C double bond OOH, and the ammonia has an H plus added to it. So that is the structure of an amino acid when it is in low pH. When dilute hydrochloric acid is added to butyl amine and the solution is allowed to evaporate to dryness, a white solid forms. What is the formula of the white solid? Well, let's look. We are adding dilute hydrochloric acid to butyl amine. Can you see what is butyl amine? Four carbons and then an NH2. I'm adding HCl to it. It forms an ammonium chloride. So my structure here would be the one shown in B. Four carbons with an NH3Cl instead of the NH2. Amines may be prepared by the reduction of nitriles. Identify the nitrile and the reducing agent used to prepare butyl amine. Okay, we're trying to make what? Butyl amine. So which nitrile should I use? Butane nitrile. That's the name of that one. And then, what is the reducing agent? Remember, to change nitriles to amines, I can either use lithium aluminum hydride or what they call lithium tetrahydroaluminate, or I could use hydrogen in presence of nickel catalyst. This will change the nitrile into an amine. The structure of crotonamide is shown. What is the repeat unit of the polymer formed from that? Well, we said this is something that has a double bond. So when we draw polymers of uh, something that is an alkene, what, what do we do? The double bond becomes single. And we draw a bond on the left and a bond on the right in order to repeat, to write the repeat unit of that. So which of these options is the same as the one drawn up there now? So that is. A. Okay. The structure of a hydrocarbon is shown. How many peaks will there be in the carbon 13 NMR? Okay. The number of peaks will depend on the different number of, uh, or the number of different carbon environments. So let's take a look at this. Where are the carbons? Now, the two methyl groups there, which I put in blue, are similar. The two carbons attached to them are similar because this is actually a symmetric molecule. So that means how many different carbon environments do I have? I actually have a total of four different carbon environments. So I will have four peaks in my carbon 13 NMR. 
the structures of these molecules are shown. How would you expect the solubility of cocaine in water? and the pH of its solution to compare with that other molecule. Well, let's take a look at the two of them. What is the difference between the cocaine and the other one? The cocaine is an ester, while the other one is an acid. So which one is more soluble? Will, be, will the cocaine be more soluble or less soluble than the acid? You should remember that acids form hydrogen bonds with water, so the ester will be less soluble. Now, which one will have higher pH? Of course, the acidic one has lower pH, so the cocaine will have a higher pH. The use of recrystallization to purify a chemical compound depends on how its solubility in the solvent varies with temperature. How should the solubility of the compound depend on temperature? Remember, what do we do in crystallization? I need to do crystallization. In order to do crystallization, I need to heat until it dissolves. So my solid or my compound should be soluble at high temperature. But then when I leave it to cool, it should be less soluble, form crystal so that I can filter it out. So remember that crystallization is based on the fact that at high temperature, my compound will dissolve. But then at low temperature, it is not soluble, so it will form crystals. Okay, in this next section, he says this question is about the chemistry of vanadium. The standard electrode potentials of some electrode, uh, vanadium species are shown. Explain the highest stable oxidation state formed by vanadium by referring to its electronic configuration. So you want to tell what is the highest oxidation state possible and why. Well, let's take a look at vanadium. Vanadium is, it has 23 electrons, so this would be the electron configuration of vanadium. Now, when it forms or when we uh, form an ion, how do we form ions? We said we will remove first the two electrons in the 4S. So I can form a V plus 2. And then we can remove one of each of the 3D electrons. So that means that my oxidation number can be plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, and plus 5. This is because I have a total of 2 electrons in the 4S and 3 in the 3D. So the highest oxidation state possible is plus a student suggests that the ion VO2 plus may be converted into V3 plus using sodium thiosulfate with no other vanadium species being formed by reduction. So we are trying to uh, change VO2 plus or react VO2 plus with sodium thiosulfate and form only V3 plus. Justify the use of sodium thiosulfate for this reaction. By writing the relevant equations, calculating their E cell values, use the standard electrode potentials given in the table that we previously showed, and values from your data booklet. So he gives you values here in this table uh, for certain reactions, and you can use anything else from the data booklet. Okay, what does he want you to do? He wants to react sodium thiosulfate with VO2 plus, and he wants to change it to V3 plus with no further reduction. So let's take a look. If we're talking about the sodium thiosulfate, the equation from the data booklet is this. And we want this from the table previously shown. I would write the equations as they should be. What we do, what I do is write the equations out so i want to what i don't want the s4o6 to s2o3 i want the opposite and if we use the opposite then the e of that uh, reaction is the opposite sign so if he says that s4o6 to s2o3 is plus 0.09 i don't i want the opposite so that would be minus 0.09 
And then I want this VO2 plus to V3 plus, so that is as it is, plus 0.34. Now, overall, we said we need to cancel the electrons. If necessary, we um, multiply that second equation all through by two so that it's two electrons, not one. Uh, remember, when you multiply by two, you do not multiply the E cell. The E cell is still plus 0.34. Now, the overall reaction that you're trying to do, the VO2 plus reacting with the thiosulfate to give V3 plus, has an E cell of plus 0.25. So long as it is positive, that means this reaction is feasible. But then he doesn't want the V3 plus to be further reduced. So let's take a look at the equations. The S2O3 goes to S, uh, S2O3 2 minus goes to S4O6 2 minus, and we the V3 plus. If it is further reduced to V2 plus, you will find that the overall E of the cell is a negative number. That means this will not occur. This is not a feasible reaction. Okay. Explain why nickel is not a suitable reagent to convert VO2 plus to V3 plus with no other vanadium species being formed. Okay, well, let's take a look. Nickel from the uh, data booklet. This is the information we get. And this is the one we had from the table that he gives me. So if we write the equations for the cell he's talking about, he wants the nickel to react, so the nickel will be oxidized. And that means we're using the opposite of that equation on top, so the sign is opposite. So instead of minus 0.25, it's plus 0.25. Then the VO2 plus the uh, H plus to give V3 plus, that has a cell, e cell of po plus 0.34. Now, overall, we add them all up. The overall reaction has an E of plus 0.59. So this will react. This will work. But then the problem is he doesn't want any further reduction. Now, if we try further reduction using the nickel, we will find that the overall E of that cell is minus 0 0.01. That is very close to zero. And that means some reduction of V3 plus would likely occur. So we don't want this. And that is why nickel would not be suitable. Are we following? Okay. The next part says most vanadium produced is used to make a steel alloy called ferro-vanadium. The vanadium content of ferro-vanadium may be determined by a titration method. So pay attention. What is he doing? He's taking the sample of ferro-vanadium, dissolving it in chloric acid. Now this forms a vanadium species of VO3 minus. So now I have in solution. VO3 minus. Then that resulting solution is transferred to 250 centimeter cubed, washings added, solutions made up to the mark, and so on. And that means whatever amount of ferrovanadium we started with is now in 250 centimeter cubed volumetric plus. Then he's going to use a pipette and take 25 centimeter cubed of that solution transferred to a conical flask so in i put all the amount of ferrovanadium or the amount of vo3 minus in 250 and then we took 25 centimeter cubed of that and put it into a conical flask and then he added 25 centimeter cubed of a 0.25 mole per decimeter cubed solution of iron 2 sulfate and the iron 2 ions react with the VO3 minus ions to form Fe3+. Then the resulting solution, resulting solution means the rest of the Fe2 plus that did not react. So notice he put 25 centimeter cubed of 0.25 mole 
per decimeter cubed of FeSO4 on the VO3 minus. Now, some of it reacted with the VO3 minus and some of it is left. Now, whatever is left, the resulting solution is titrated against potassium manganate to determine the amount of Fe2 plus remaining. Okay? In an experiment, the mass of ferrovanadium that he started with was 4.87 grams. The concentration of potassium manganate was this, and he got a mean titer of this for the permanganate. Give the color of the solution at the end point of the titration. So first of all, when you're titrating with potassium manganate, you remember the original color of potassium manganate in the burette is purple. Now, as you add it to the solution, it gives a faint pink color that disappears. And then it disappears. And then at some point, at the end point, the pale pink color becomes permanent. It doesn't disappear. So the color of the solution at the end of the titration, whenever we're titrating with potassium manganate, is pale pink, the first drop of permanent pale pink in the flask. So just why the VO2 plus ions formed do not affect the titration. So he's telling me that the VO2 plus that is formed does not affect the titration. Well, let us take a look. The VO2 plus forms VO, uh, VO2 plus forms VO2 plus. And that is uh, plus, uh, E cell is plus one. Now, we're titrating with manganate, and manganate has this uh, E of reduction. Now, let's take a look at the equations. If we're starting with this, and we're using the permanganate, and remember that the first equation has only one electron, the second equation has five, so I had to multiply that first equation all through by five. And then we are doing the opposite of what we have up there. So instead of um VO2 plus plus 2H plus, we're doing the opposite. So the E cell has negative of 1 minus 1 volt. Overall, what is the overall uh, E cell? It is plus 0.5. So the manganate ions actually should oxidize the VO2 plus since the E cell is positive, but because he says it does not affect the titration, then most probably the rate of the reaction is slow, so it would react, but it is slow probably due to high activation energy, so that is why he's saying it will not affect the titration. Then he says, in an experiment, the mass of ferrovanadium, this is what he gave me. And he wants me to calculate the percentage by mass of vanadium in the ferrovanadium. So this information on top, this is what he gave me at the beginning. He said he started with 4.87 grams. Concentration of potassium manganate was this. He used a mean titer of potassium manganate, 22.5 centimeter cubed. The resulting solution, he said, when we did this titration, we were doing the um titration of what was left from the fe2 plus but when he used 4.87 he put it in 250 and then he took 25 of that remember we said this and he put it into the conical flask and then he put 25 centimeter cubed of 0.25 mole solution of iron 2 sulfate so this was the information he gave me. And based on this, he's telling us to calculate the percentage by mass of vanadium in the ferro-vanadium. Okay. What are we doing? We're doing reaction of manganate with Fe2+. But this is with the Fe2+, that was left after... It reacted with the VO3 minus. So the VO3 minus reacted with some of the Fe2 plus. The manganate was titrated with the rest that did not react. So, first of all, what are we going to do? He's telling me that the potassium permanganate that I was using 
uh, was 0.0195 mole per decimeter cubed and the volume is 22.5, so I can get number of moles of manganese. Concentration times volume, the volume of course is divided by 1000. This gives me the number of moles of manganese. Now, looking at that first equation that you have there between manganate and Fe2+, you can see that one mole of manganate reacts with five moles of Fe2+. So the, if this is the number of moles of manganate, what would be the number of moles of Fe2+, plus? five times of that, okay? And that is the number of moles of what? This is the number of moles of Fe2+, plus that was left in the flask after it reacted with the VO3. Okay, and that means that if I look at this originally, he put 25 centimeter cubed of 0.25 mole per decimeter cubed of FeSO4. So I can get the original number of moles of Fe2 plus that were added. Concentration times volume, this gives me the 0 0.00625 mole. So this is the total Fe2 plus that we added at the beginning. Now, that other number of moles of Fe2 plus that we got was what was left after reaction. So the number of moles that reacted is the difference between them. That gives me a certain number of moles of Fe2 plus. And then if you look at that second equation, you find that the number of moles of Fe2 plus is the same as number of moles of VO3 minus and that means that the number of moles of Fe2 plus that reacted that I got is the same as the number of moles of VO3 minus in 25 that he had in the conical flask. But then the original solution was 250. So if he has this number of moles in 25, then in 250 multiply by 10. So that is the number of moles of VO3 minus. And you should remember that that would be the same as the number of moles of vanadium. So the mass of vanadium is the number of moles times its MR. So we got a mass of vanadium 2.0645 grams. How do we get, what is he asking for? Percentage by mass. So the percentage by mass, he originally put how much ferro-vanadium? He put 4.87. So the percentage vanadium is the mass of vanadium we got over the original mass of ferrovanadium times 100. This gives us a percent of uh, vanadium of 42.4%. Can you follow this? Okay. Then he says, in the manufacture of sulfuric acid, vanadium oxide is the catalyst used in the conversion of sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide. Write two equations to show a possible mechanism for this reaction. So, remember we said, if vanadium oxide, V2O5, is a catalyst, that means we added it, it will react and then be regenerated if it's a catalyst. So you need to write two equations to show that the V2O5 reacted and then it was reformed. So equations like this would be possible equations. So if I'm starting with the V2O5, we're going to say that the V2O5 reacted with the SO2 to, get, to give SO3. And then what was formed is then re-oxidized by oxygen so it gives me back the V2O5. So that means that the V2O5 overall remains unchanged. So it is a cat. Okay. Remember, this is a question with a star. And the question with a star, he gives you grades on how you present your answer. So let's try and understand and then see how we should write the answer. He's saying delocalized electron systems are important in determining the chemical properties of some compounds. Compare and contrast the chemical reactions of bromine with benzene, cyclohexene, and with benzene and phenol 
by considering the effects of delocalized electrons. So you're trying to react bromine with benzene, cyclohexene, and phenol, and you're trying to compare and contrast between these three reactions with respect to delocalized electrons. Detailed descriptions of the bonds or reaction mechanisms involved are not required. So, what are we talking about? Delocalized electron systems, what does that mean? Remember that the benzene ring has double bonds uh, using the 6p orbitals of the 6 carbon atoms. And we said that the double bonds can be rearranged because we have delocalized pi system that covers the whole benzene ring and that is why we draw it with a circle in the middle for example so instead of drawing it with three individual double bonds because the double bonds are constantly actually equally spread around on all the carbons we say this is a delocalized electron system this causes benzene to be stable. If we're looking at phenol, phenol has the same idea, but it also has electrons from the oxygen. So the electrons from the oxygen contribute to the delocalized electrons. So actually the phenol reacts faster with bromine than the reaction of bromine with benzene. What about cyclohexene? Cyclohexene just has one double bond. So there is no delocalized electron system. So it reacts very quickly and that's it. Okay? So what are you going to explain? You're going to explain that the pi electrons in the double bonds of all of them react with what? They react with electrophiles. Remember that it is the electrons from the double bond that go or attack the electrophile. Now, what is the difference? So this is something in all of them. All of them react with electrophiles. If we're talking specifically about cyclohexene, we say in cyclohexene, the pi electrons of the double bond are not delocalized. I just have one double bond. They undergo electrophilic addition. This is a very quick reaction to form 1,2-dibromocyclohexene. So that is with respect to cyclohexene. What about benzene and phenol now? In benzene and phenol, we said the pi electrons are delocalized. So this forms a stable electron cloud, and what they do is not addition, they do substitution. So they undergo electrophilic substitution. So we said in the benzene ring, for example, there is delocalized pi system. This causes a stable electron cloud it undergoes electrophilic substitution. So in benzene, the delocalized electron ring is very stable. The reaction with bromine requires a catalyst. So you don't just put it with bromine and it reacts. You have to add a catalyst, which is usually aluminum chloride or ion uh, 3 bromide that will cause uh, electrophilic substitution and forming bromobenzene. What about phenol? We said the phenol, the reaction is faster than benzene. It does not require a catalyst. So this is because in phenol, the lone pair of electrons in the oxygen overlap with the delocalized pi electrons of the benzene ring. So the reaction of phenol with bromine forms 2,4,6-tribromophenol without a catalyst. Are we following? And this is how you explain. You get grades for explaining properly in the correct order, giving all the information that he's asking for. The next question says, conine is the toxic compound present in poison hemlock. The structure of conine is shown with R representing an alkyl group. Remember the word alkyl group just means carbon, carbon, carbon with hydrogens. A sample of 0.235 grams of conine was vaporized at this temperature and this pressure, and the volume of the vapor was this. Show by calculation that the molar mass of conine is this. How do we get molar mass when he's giving me all of this information? Remember, we use the ideal gas law, so PV is equal to nRT. 
but you should know that n is number of moles number of moles is mass over molecular mass so you can rearrange this equation to get molecular mass now in order to put it into the equation the temperature has to be in kelvin so if he gives me in degree celsius i have to add 273 the volume also has to be in meter cubed so if he gives it to me in centimeter cubed, I multiply that is 10 to the minus 6, or I divide by 10 to the 6. Then I can put them into the equation. So the mass is 0.235 grams, R is a constant, 8.31, temperature in Kelvin over pressure in meter cubed, times the, vo uh, sorry, pressure in uh, Pascal and the volume in meter cubed this gives me an mr of 127 gram per mole then he says did use the molecular formula of the alkyl group so we're trying to find out what is r using the structure of conine and the molar mass that we just got so what do we have we have this is the structure of conine the uh, molar mass we said is 127 that's what we just calculated and you can see that actually what i have is c5h10n and then i have the r group so i can get the mr of that part without the r group if all of them is 127 then that part without the r group is 12 times 5 for the carbon plus 10 times 1 for the hydrogen, plus 14 for the nitrogen. So that part without the R is 84. And all of it is 127. So the R alone is the difference. So I found that the R is actually 43 grams per mole. The MR of that R group is 43. He wants what? He wants the molecular formula. So this tells me that the molecular formula is C3H7. It's an alkyl group, that means carbons and hydrogens. How many carbons, how many hydrogens would give me 43 grams per mole? Well, three carbons, three times 12, that's 36, plus seven, that's 43, so this is correct. So my R group is something that has three carbons and seven hydrogens. Then he says the table summarizes the low resolution proton and MR data for the R group. So he's telling me that in that R group, I have three proton environments. One of them has, remember that the peak area tells me how many hydrogens I have in there. So I have a proton environment that has three hydrogens, another one has two hydrogens, and the third one has two hydrogens. So and the total MR is 43. So either it is this or that. Which one, according to the proton NMR, is the correct? Well, you should realize that that first one has three proton environments, while the one that is isopropyl has only two proton environments because the two methyl groups are identical so the two methyl groups should give only one peak uh with that contains a peak area that should tell you six hydrogens so obviously it's not the isopropyl it is the straight chain alkyl group so this is what we have because this will have three hydrogen environments uh, proton environments one of them has three hydrogens the other has two hydrogens and the third one has two hydrogens so this is uh, what agrees with his uh, proton nmr data then he says in the high resolution proton nmr data for the r group the peak for the proton environment two is a sextant so this was the molecule again and we said we had three different environments now, environment two, he's saying is the sexist. We agree. You understand why the hydrogens that we numbered two would give a splitting system that has six uh, peaks or six splits? This is because on one end, we have three hydrogens on the neighboring carbon. And on the other end, we have two hydrogens on the neighboring carbon. That means we have a total of five hydrogens. On the neighboring carbon, so the splitting will be six or six that. 
did use the splitting patterns for the proton environments of one and three. So one, can you see? One, the proton that we labeled one. On the neighboring hydrogen, I have two. So this will be a triplet. So the one that is labeled one would be a triplet. Two, we said, is a sextet. Now, what about three? Well, three has on the right, the carbon on the right has two hydrogens. But then the carbon on the left, which is on the ring, also has a hydrogen. So actually, we have a total of three hydrogens surrounding it. So this will be a quartet. Do we understand why it's a quartet? Okay. Remember that the splittings are what we call n plus 1. So count the number of hydrogens on the neighboring carbons and add 1. Do we understand that? Okay. Explain using a diagram which type of stereoisomerism is shown by this molecule. In your diagram, use R to represent the alkyl group. So what kind of stereoisomerism can we have here? We don't have a double bond, so we don't have cis trans or things like that. But we do have a chiral center. Remember that that carbon that has the R has four different groups attached to it. So it would show optical isomerism since it contains a chiral center. So it will give two uh, stereoisomers or optical isomers that are not superimposing. So this is because it has a chiral center or a carbon bonded to four different groups. Okay, this question says many oxides of transition metals are used as colored pigment. Now, something called viridian is a blue-green pigment with this formula, M2O3 to what? And he's saying when a sample of this is heated until all the water of crystallization is removed, the mass is reduced by 19.15%. So identify what is the element. Okay, let's take a look at this. M2O3 to water. If I were to calculate the total MR of that, that would be twice the molecular mass of M plus uh, 3 times 16 plus the part of the water, that's 2 times 18. So this should give me the total MR. But the problem is I don't know what is M. But he tells me that the 2 water part, which is the 2 times 18 part, which is 36, is actually 19.15% of that molecule. So what is the total of that molecule? So if the 36 is only 19.15, so how much is the 100%? And that tells me that the total MR should be 188. Can you see that? Just simple cross multiplication. Okay, so now I know that the total MR should be 188. So that means that the 188 is the 2m plus 84 so the 2m alone will be the difference between that so twice of the molecular mass of m is 104 and that means m is 52 now when you look for molecular mass of a transition metal in the periodic table that comes out to be chromium okay so we identified m as chromium Cobalt-2 oxide is used in ceramics industry as an additive to produce blue glazes and enamels. Cobalt oxide dissolves in sulfuric acid to give a pink aqueous solution of cobalt sulfate. When concentrated hydrochloric acid is added to aqueous cobalt sulfate, a dark blue solution forms. Name the type of reaction that occurs when concentrated hydrochloric acid is added to aqueous cobalt sulfate. Remember, what kind of reaction is he talking about? When we have cobalt ions and they have different colors, remember that this is called ligand substitution because the cobalt at the beginning has, for example, six water molecules complex to it or coordinated with it or attached to it, while 
and this is the one that is pink and now if it has four chlorines for example then that is blue so we're substituting the water uh, ligands with the um, chlorine this is called ligand substitution write an ionic equation for the reaction that occurs when concentrated hydrochloric acid is added to aqueous cobalt sulfate remember we said what happens is it changes from cobalt with six water to cobalt with four chlorines so this is the kind of equation that you're expected to write so the cobalt with the six water has a total of two plus you need to react it with 4Cl- minus to give COCl4, which has a 2-, minus, and the 6 water uh, is released. Do we understand this? Okay. Explain why the shape of the complex ion changes when concentrated hydrochloric acid is added. Remember we said when it has water at the beginning, this would have 6. Um, water molecules attached to it so this is an octahedral structure but when it has four it becomes a tetrahedral structure why does this happen because remember that the chloride ions are much larger than the water molecules so they will be too large to put six of them around the cobalt so we can put only four so it becomes tetrahedral then in the last section, he's talking about chemicals from plants. And he's saying plants are a rich source of useful chemicals, although their applications have often predated the identification of the active compound. One of the best known examples of this is the use of willow bark extracts to reduce pain and fevers, a practice that is at least 2,000 years old. And then they found out that the active compound in the willow uh, bark is something called salicine. In the body, salicine is changed into salicylaldehyde and then salicylic acid. And salicylic acid may in turn be converted to 2-acetoxybenzene carboxylic acid, a compound which we call aspirin, one of the most widely used medications in the world okay and he gives me the structures of these different compounds and he's asking first calculate the percentage composition by mass of elements in salicine so if we go back this was the structure he gave us for salicine and he's asking us to calculate the percent composition of the element so in order to do that, first we need to know what is the formula. So if you write out, I like to write out all the carbons and hydrogen so that we can be able to count them. And we find that we have C13, H18, O7. So I can use that to get the overall MR of the molecule. I find that the MR of the molecule as a whole is 286. How do we get percent composition? It's the part of that element over the total times 100. So the percent carbon is the 13 times 12 over the total times 100. The percent hydrogen is the 18 over the total times 100. The percent oxygen is the 16 times 7 over the total times 100. So this comes out to the percentage composition of each element. The first stage in the breakdown of salicine results in the formation of salicyl alcohol. And he's saying salicyl alcohol is readily oxidized in the lab to form salicylic acid. So he's trying to change this alcohol into the acid. State the reagents and conditions needed for this oxidation. How do we change an alcohol to an acid? We use an oxidizing agent with heating under reflux. So the reagents are potassium dichromate and concentrate sulfuric acid or oxidized um, acidified potassium dichromate and you heat under reflux. 
So heating on the reflux gives the acid. But then he's saying the boiling temperature of salicylaldehyde is 197. So just why this makes it very difficult to obtain the aldehyde when we oxidize the alcohol. So he's saying, I want to oxidize the alcohol. Getting acid is easy. We said potassium dichromate to concentrate sulfuric acid and uh, heat on the reflux. What if we want the aldehyde? Well, the problem is if we want to get the aldehyde, that means we need to distill it as it is formed. We cannot heat it on the reflux. And if the boiling temperature is high, then it will be hard to distill the product and separate it from the mixture before any further oxidation to acid. That is why we cannot get the aldehyde, we will probably get the acid only. Aromatic aldehydes such as salicylaldehyde may be prepared in the laboratory by electrophilic substitution. For example, benzaldehyde may be obtained by reacting benzene with a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen chloride in the presence of aluminium chloride. The mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen chloride reacts like methanoyl chloride. Do you remember the acid chloride reactions in the syllabus? Write an equation for the formation of the electrophile from methanoyl chloride. If I'm trying to react uh, with methanoyl chloride, we what we do is we get it as an electrophile and then it reacts. How, we do, how do we do that? We put it with the aluminium chloride. So actually, if we were writing the mechanism, remember this is the mechanism. What happens is with aluminium chloride or in presence of aluminium chloride, the methanoyl chloride would form a carbocation there. And then the carbocation would react. So if he says, write the equation, what was the equation? The methanoyl chloride reacts with the aluminium chloride to form the carbocation plus the aluminium chloride with a negative sign because now it has an extra Cl on it. Do we understand this? So that bottom equation is the one he requires. And then once we have this carbocation, then it can react. So he's saying, draw the mechanism for the formation of the benzaldehyde from benzene using the electrophile that we got. So we're trying to get benzaldehyde from benzene. That means the benzene will have to react with that electrophile that we just made. And this is how electrophilic uh, substitution works, that the double bond attacks the carbocation and then the electrons with that hydrogen are released to the carbocation to form the aldehyde. The other product would be the HCl and the aluminium chloride. Salicylaldehyde may be used in the synthesis of cumarine, and he gives me the formula. A compound which occurs in many plants, cumarine is in turn used to prepare something called warfarin, a compound prescribed to reduce blood clotting. Now, one suggested synthesis of cumarine from salicylaldehyde, so he wants to start with salicylaldehyde, involves the formation of an intermediate compound F. Can you see what F looks like? So he's starting with salicylaldehyde. He's going to make F and then go on to make cumarine. So devise a synthesis of F using salicylaldehyde and bromoethane as the only organic starting material. So we want to react salicylaldehyde and we have bromoethane. We want to change the salicylaldehyde to that compound F. Include any other reagents and intermediate compounds and give essential reaction conditions. Usually when he says this question, the first thing you ask yourself is, what are we adding to that compound? So, salicylaldehyde, I'm going to add two carbons, and I need a double bond to attach it to the rest of that compound. 
So how do we do that? Remember, when we do this, we can use what we call the Grignard reagent. So if I'm starting with a bromoalkane, like bromoethane, if you add magnesium powder in dry ether and heat under reflux, these are conditions, we get what we call the Grignard reagent or ethyl magnesium bromide. Now, this Grignard reagent can react with the aldehyde. And when it does that, it adds the alkyl group, the C2H5 part, and it forms an alcohol instead of the C double bond O. So the C double bond O becomes OH, and you added that extra two part. Now, what do we need to do next? Well, we need a double bond instead of the OH. That means dehydration. So I can add concentrated phosphoric acid and heat. And we remove water to get the double bond so that this is my compound F. Okay? Salicylaldehyde combines with 1,2-diaminoethane in a condensation reaction to form something which he calls salin ligand. Salin ligand reacts with many metal ions to form very stable complexes which are useful catalysts. So the question is, draw a diagram of the complex that one salin ligand forms with nickel ion. So we want to put a nickel ion in here. How do we put it? Remember that the nickel will be attached to the um, elements that have extra lone pair of electrons. So it will be complexed or attached to the nitrogens because the nitrogens have lone pair of electrons and the oxygens that have a lone pair of electrons. So you can have the OH or just the O. Remember that the bonds here are actually dative bonds in which the electrons are donated by the nitrogen or the oxygen. Last part of this exam, explain why the salin ligand complex of the nickel plus two ions is much more stable than the aqua complex of the same ion. Remember that if we're forming salin ligand complex, then number of particles will be much more, and that means the entropy of the system will increase and the uh, complex will be much more stable. Okay, so that is the end of this paper. I hope this was useful to you, and uh, please continue listening. Thank you.